All right, let's do this orthogonal curve. We had already gotten our derivatives, I think, right? We ended up with a derivative over here of dy dx for the first one. Oh, geez, what did that come out to be? Negative, what was it? Negative uh, 2x over 3y. Over yeah, and then yeah. this other one came out to be dy dx was, what does that come out to be? 3x squared over 2y? That sound familiar to everybody? Is that where we were last time? Yeah. yeah. All right. Look at that. We're gonna we're gonna do some math here. Finally. So, if we want to prove that these two curves have tangent lines that are perpendicular to each other at this point, all we have to do is evaluate each of these at those points. So, at one one, what's this one become? The first one is negative two thirds, and the second one is three halves. Are these two numbers opposite reciprocals? Yeah. Yep. Therefore, the tangent lines are perpendicular to each other and the curves are orthogonal. And then at one negative one, this one comes out to be a positive two thirds and this one comes out to be a negative three halves. And once again, they're opposite reciprocals. And therefore, if they're opposite reciprocals, the curves, I can spell the word curves, don't worry. The curves are orthogonal. Good or no? Not as good as fruit snacks, but still pretty good. All right. So now we're going to move on and do some stuff that's more painful and more complicated and we're going to try to find the equations of all the vertical tangent lines of this equation so the first thing you're going to do is you're going to take the derivative of this and solve for dy dx and then we're going to work from there so i want you to find the derivative of this you have two minutes ready go Do you have your derivative? Yes. 2 minus 3 dy dx equals 2x minus 3y squared dy dx to start with. Is that correct? Yep. And then you subtracted the 2x and added the 3 probably or else vice versa. Um, but if you subtract the 2x, you'll end up with 2 minus 2x. And if you add the 3, you'll end up with a 3 minus 3y squared all times a dy dx. And your dy dx should be 2 minus 2x over 3 minus 3y squared. Everybody good there? Yes. All right. So we want to know then when does this have vertical tangent lines? And so if the derivative is what does a function have? Yeah, if the derivative is undefined, 
that's when we have vertical tangent lines, right? So vertical tangent lines means that dy dx is undefined, okay? not indeterminate, so it can't be a zero over a zero. Okay? It's just going to be undefined, so just the denominator equals zero. So let's figure out when does the denominator <laughs> equal zero. Three minus three y squared equals zero if y equals what? Plus or minus one. I think my sound went out again. What do we get? Y equals what? Positive or negative one. Oh, good. I can hear you guys and you can hear me. It's spectacular. Did you guys say that like a bunch of times? No? Okay. All right, so when your y equals positive or negative one is when we have vertical tangent lines. Um, so let's uh, figure out what happens when y is equal to one or negative one, because these are not vertical tangent lines. These are just y values at which those tangent lines occur. So how do we figure out what the actual tangent line is? What do we need to do with y equals plus or minus one? Get back into the original equation. Right. Put it back into the original equation and see what the x values are because a vertical line should always have an equation of x equals something. So we've got 2x minus 3 equals x squared minus 1. If we plug in it, y equals 1, which would give us x squared minus 2x plus 2 equals 0. Quadratics are easy to solve, right? unless the discriminant, the b squared minus 4ac is negative, in which case, just like this one, this has no real solutions. You guys agree that that doesn't have any real solutions? If you try to use the quadratic formula, four minus four times one times two is four minus eight and you get a negative four inside the square root. Everybody agreed that that doesn't have any real solutions? Yes. yes. All right, and then what about y equals negative one? We should end up with two x plus three equals x squared plus one. And if we simplify that, put it all to one side, we get x squared minus two x minus two equals zero. And that one we should be able to solve. <clears throat> so if we got x squared minus 2x minus 2 equals 0, then what do we need to do? Complete the square? Let's complete the square. <laughs> x squared minus 2x equals 2, right? And what number do we have to add to the left-hand side to make it a perfect square? That's right, a 1. Right, we'll add a one to this side. If we had a one to one side, we have to add a one to the other side. You all are familiar with completing the square, right? A lot of silence out there. You guys know how to complete the square? Yep. Okay. So we end up with x equals one plus or minus root three. And those should be our two vertical tangent lines. Now, we need to check in our derivative and make sure the numerator is not zero at x equals one plus or minus root three. Why do we need to do that? So the slope isn't indeterminate? Right, because then that would mean that the slope was indeterminate here, rather than just undefined from the denominator equaling zero. So at y equals one, there were no x values that gave me that, so I didn't need to worry about anything there, but at y equals one, x equaled one plus or minus root three. And if I plug in one plus or minus root three, is this numerator gonna be zero? No. No, so we're good. All right. 
let's take a look at the graph of this equation. Maybe in Desmos. All right, what is our equation? Now I've forgotten it. 2x minus 3y right? equals what is it? What does that equal? x squared minus y cubed. x squared minus y cubed. All right. And this is what that looks like. Pretty interesting looking little graph there, yeah? Yeah, I agree. And if you put in x equals 1 plus the square root of 3, there it is. And if you put in x equals 1 minus the square root of 3, there it is. Both of them tangent to this little not, not elliptical looking little thing, sort of elliptical looking, whatever you want to call that. I don't know. Looks like a flying saucer or something. I don't know. UFO. I don't know. What does it look like? I don't know what it looks like. It looks like something. A fruit snack. It looks like a fruit snack. I like potato also. Potato is good. guitar pick. My son plays the guitar really, really poorly, but then he stopped playing it because he threw it at the wall of his room, and then I took it away. Isn't that a fun story? All right, here's what I want somebody to do. <clears throat> Actually, never mind. Nobody's going to do this. I'm going to do this. I posted up your implicit differentiation assignment. We're still doing work. I just want to show you guys this really cool graph while we have a minute here. You guys all have looked at your implicit differentiation assignment. It says it's due on like someday. I think Monday probably, because I made it fairly long with a lot of problems. If you look at number six on that, everybody look at number six on that. Uh, I know you didn't look at it, John. You were asleep the whole time. Um, so just for fun, I want to graph this so you guys can see what this graph looks like. It's called the bouncing wagon curve. Guess what it looks like? It looks like a bouncing wagon. What does that even look like? It looks like a, it looks like a bouncing wagon. I don't know how I can be more clear than that. It looks like a bouncing wagon. It looks like a bouncing wagon. See, it's like a wagon bouncing along the road. It's a bouncing wagon. Isn't that cool? Aren't implicit dirt? Implicit equations, really interesting. No one can convince me that there's a practical application of this. This is where I reach my limit. Oh, ha, 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 where you reach your limit. Ha, ha, how clever. Jellyfish? This does not look like a jellyfish, does it? I guess maybe a little. It doesn't have very many tentacles. All right, enough of this nonsense. Back to work. Let's see if we can find the, actually, let's not bother with this one. Let's do this one. Let's see if we can find the locations of all the horizontal and the vertical tangent lines for this equation. So the first thing you're going to need to do is what? You're going to need to take a derivative. Yeah, take a derivative. So you're going to take the derivative of this, and then from there, what are you going to do? Set the numerator equal to zero for the horizontal tangent lines and set the denominator equal to zero for the vertical tangent lines. But first, you guys find the derivative. Take two minutes, find the derivative, solve for dy dx. Ready, go.
Here, I'll get your derivative. Alright, hopefully something like this, 4x minus 2x dy dx minus 2y plus 2y dy dx equals 0. And then, yeah. and then it, when you simplified that down, brought your 2y and your 4x to the other side, so you had a 2y minus a 4x, and on this side you would have had a, I guess that's a negative 2x minus a 2y times our dy dx. And so something like dy dx equals 2y minus 4x over negative 2x minus 2y. I don't particularly like having the uh, negatives in the denominator, both those two negatives. I guess that's fine. Yeah, I'll just leave it. I guess it's fine. Well, let's divide out the uh, the twos in here. Oh, that should be a plus two y anyway. I don't know why I have a minus two y there. Um, sorry about that. So we can at least divide out. The what? I couldn't. I couldn't hear what you. Um, how did you get, um, the y squared? Remember, uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what you're saying because something's up with your mic. Maybe you can type it in the chat. We'll wait, I'll give you a second to type it in. Ah, uh, you figured it out? All right. No problem. Okay, so everybody good with this is our derivative, y minus 2x over y minus x? Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. So then if we want to find horizontal and vertical tangent lines, we need to set both the numerator and the denominator equal to z. You guys would agree with that? Mm -hmm. numerator for horizontal and denominator for vertical. So let's do, let's do the denominator first. Let's do our vertical tangent lines. So that means that y minus x needs to equal zero. Well, what's different about this than the previous one we did? Do you have two variables? We have two different variables in that equation, right? So we know that we get y equals x, right? But how do we know when y equals x? we need to plug in y equals x into our original equation. So anywhere we see a y, we're gonna replace it with an x. So that will give us 2x squared minus 2x times x plus x squared minus four equals zero. Everybody good with that? So that's gonna tell us when y equals x, for what x values does y equal x in this equation. And if we simplify that down, we just get x squared minus four equals zero or x equals plus or minus two. Everybody good with that or no? That makes sense. All right, then let's do horizontal. So for horizontal, we know that y minus 2x needs to equal 0, or y equals 2x. So we'll replace all the y's with 2x's. 
Two x squared minus four x squared plus four x squared minus four equals zero. And that gives us what? X squared equals two or x equals plus or minus root two. Everybody good with that? So this is where our horizontal tangent lines occur, and this is where our vertical tangent lines occur, and that's actually also the equations of the vertical tangent line. Good or no? It's good. Okay. Um, so you're going to have lots of practice with uh, fun stuff like this on that implicit differentiation little packet, a little bit longer than the previous things and a little more difficult too. So spend some, some real good time this weekend um, working on that. Okay. All right. Next thing that we want to be able to do is find a second derivative implicitly. So that's going to be our goal now is to find a second derivative implicitly. So the second derivative is just the derivative of the first derivative, right? Isn't that, let me ask what a second derivative is, right? Second derivative is the derivative of the first derivative. So what do we need in order to find a second derivative? We need the first, first derivative. derivative. Right, so all right, take one minute and find the first derivative of this for me and we'll make sure you get it right. But take a minute and do it on your own. Ready, go. Hopefully you got that as your first step. I hope. And then bring the one over and subtract the two y and you end up with two x plus one over one minus two y. Everybody good with that or no? Makes sense. Okay. So then to find the second derivative, we want to take the derivative with respect to x, right? That should be our second derivative. So we need to take the derivative of 2x plus 1 over 1 minus 2y with respect to x. So as we do that, what rule do we need to use? Quotient rule. Quotient rule. So we will get the second derivative with respect to x is equal to v, which is our denominator, times the derivative of our numerator, which is 2, minus u, our numerator, times the derivative of our denominator. And what is the derivative of 1 minus 2y? with respect to x. Minus 2 dy dx. Minus 2 dy dx, right? Because we're still taking the derivative of a y term with respect to x. And then all over 1 minus 2y squared. And this looks wonderful and lovely. 
except that we have a dy dx term still in it and we have to get rid of that dy dx term. So how are we gonna get rid of that dy dx term? Isn't that thing right there that I just circled dy dx? Can't I just replace dy dx with that? The, the answer is yes, yes, I can. And so I will. So we end up with one minus two y times two, or two minus four y, minus this two x plus one times negative two times two x plus one over one minus two y, all over one minus two y squared. Everybody good with that? Any questions on that? All right, let's see if you can do this one on your own. I'll give you about four or five minutes and try and try and get through all of this one by yourself. See if you can do it and then we'll go through and make sure you got it right. Everybody know what to do, right? We're going to take the derivative, find dy dx, and then take the derivative of that. Everybody good? I'll take that as a yes, or I'll say you can't hear me at all. Ready, go.
How's this coming along? You guys finished? Do you need another minute? I think we're close to done. All right, I'll give you guys about one more minute and then, uh, then we'll start talking about it. I'm going to start writing out the first derivative though, while you guys are finishing up just to make sure everyone got that all right. That what you all got for your first derivative, I hope. Yeah. All right. Anybody still need a little time to finish finding the second derivative, or are we good to go with that? And I guess we'll just do it since nobody's going to answer. So our second derivative should be the derivative of this, which is x minus 2y, so v, du, which is negative dy dx, minus u, 1 minus y, dv, which is 1 minus 2 dy dx, all over x minus 2y squared. Everybody good there? And then all we have to do is take our dy dx's and replace them with this 1 minus y. So x minus 2y times negative 1 minus y over x minus 2y minus 1 minus y times 1 minus 2 times 1 minus y over x minus 2y, all over x minus 2y squared. Good or no? Um, will we ever have to simplify the second implicit derivative? Right, so I will not ask you specifically to simplify this. That is perfectly fine. Now, if this was a multiple choice question, it's possible that they might you know, have it written in a different um, in a different form where they actually did give everything a common denominator. So like you would multiply this one by x minus two y over x minus two y, and then you could drop the x minus two y's into the denominators if you wanted to. Um, but I doubt they will ask you to do that. And the chances of them asking about like, you know, context with having this simplify to like set the numerator or the denominator equal to zero is highly unlikely. So I'm not going to spend much time having you practice that. It's just algebra. So hopefully you can do it, but I can't imagine you'll need to. Good or not? Yes, thank you. Yeah. All right. We got a few minutes left and, uh, I would love to let you guys go a little early, but I'm not going to um, because we missed a bunch of time yesterday because of the technical difficulties. So we're going to do a couple little things here. Um, you're going to need your graphing calculator, though. So if you have your graphing calculator, you should have a graphing calculator. Grab it, have it near you. We're going to use it right now. So I'll give you all a couple seconds to grab it if it's not right by you. And then... Uh, and we'll get started. So the first thing we're going to do here is we're going to evaluate this derivative using our calculator. Everybody have a graphing calculator either on their computer or 
physical actual graphing calculator, hopefully a TI-84 plus. Hopefully. Okay. If you don't have a graphing calculator, follow along and this will all be posted so you'll be able to go back and um, practice this once you actually get your graphing calculator. But if you don't have one, you need to check one out from the school library. If you don't know when they're available, I can look it up and figure it out for you. So let me know. Um, if we want to find the derivative of any function at a specific point, our calculator can approximate this for us, and we're going to need to be able to do that this year. So obviously, this derivative is a derivative we don't know how to do yet because we haven't talked about how to take the derivative of inverse trig functions or logarithmic functions. Um, plus, even if we knew how to do that, it's going to be a pain because we're going to have to use the product rule because it's a product of two functions. And then within the product rule, we're going to use the rules for the logs and the inverse cosines, which are a pain to begin with. Plus, we're going to use the chain rule because they each have a function inside of them. So this would be a really messy derivative. But if we just want to know what the derivative is at 0.45, there's two different ways to do that using your graphing calculator. So they've got a little free trial version of the TI-84 Plus online. And hopefully you can now see it here. Can you now see it here? Yep. Spectacular. All right. So there are two different ways to do this. One is um, graph the function, and then we'll um, evaluate the derivative from there. So before you graph the function, actually, go into mode and make sure you're in radians. I right. almost forgot about that. Make sure you're in radians, go down to radians, and make sure you select radians. And don't be in degrees. Don't ever be in degrees unless I tell you to go into degrees. All right, so the first thing we're going to do now is we're going to go into the y equals, and you guys are at least moderately familiar with how your graphing calculator works, yeah? I hope. You've used it the last year or two, probably. We're going to graph inverse cosine of x to the third times log base 10, and that's just log. If they don't write a base next to it, that's log base 10 of x squared. And we're going to take a look and see what that graph looks like. Look at that. There it is. Um, if we wanted to zoom in on it, we could. Just hit zoom. Option two is zoom in. It doesn't do it unless you select a point to zoom in around. So it's already at the origin. I'll just hit enter and we'll zoom in around the origin. Darn, I shouldn't have zoomed in around the origin. Now we can't quite see the whole thing. Let's, I'm going to zoom back out. And now I'm going to zoom in centered around a different point so we can see the whole, well, uh, not the whole thing, but more of it at least. All right. If you want to calculate the derivative of this function at x equals 0.45, it's very easy. You're going to go second. Then you're going to click the trace button. And you're going to go down to option six, which is dy dx. You can also just hit six. It just goes back to the graph. It doesn't actually do anything. It doesn't show you a window to input anything. All you do is type the number you want to evaluate it at, which I believe was what, 0.45? And hit enter. And it will tell you that dy dx at 0.45, the derivative, the slope of the tangent line is 3.2789251. Very convenient if you need to evaluate the derivative of a function at some x value. This will not just take the derivative algebraically and tell you what the derivative of inverse cosine of x cubed times the log of x squared is in like an algebraic form. It will only evaluate it using an approximation at an x value that you plug in. If you try to plug in an x value that's not showing in the window of your graph, it will not do it. So if I try to calculate the derivative, let's say at three, it'll say, I can't do that because that's not within the window that I'm currently using. But if I choose one, let's say, um, uh, uh, okay, I can't use that, Never mind. If I choose something like, uh, now my graph is completely gone. I don't know why I chose one, one wasn't in there either. So um, if I choose something like 0.9, which is actually on my graph, It'll do it for me, right? Choose 
any value you want that's on the graph or within your window and it should do it. Everybody good with that? Everybody could find the derivative of a function using the graph on the graphing calculator at a certain x value. I hope. Yes, no, maybe. Yeah. All right. The other way to do it is just go to the original like home screen of your graphing calculator or whatever you call it. Um, and go to the math window <coughs> and option eight down there where it says in deriv, choose option eight. And it should bring up a window that looks like this if you have a TI-84 plus or even I think a TI-84. If you have a TI-83 plus, it'll still do everything you want it to do, but it probably pops up as a window that just says in deriv and then has a parenthesis. Anybody not have this window pop up on their wrapping calculator? Wait, how do you get there again? Math. Uh, let me clear it else. I'll go in there. Math, and then option eight. Everybody able to find that and get that window up? Anybody have a window that looks slightly differently? It says like in deriv with the parenthesis instead. It's okay if it does, I just need to know so I can tell you what to type in. Yeah, mine looks yeah. like that. In, in deriv with the parenthesis? Yeah, yeah okay. just a regular plus, not a CE. Ah, okay, yeah, that, that could be why. It's, it's also, I think, just on how, like, is, is that like an older siblings calculator or something? You've had it a while or? I am not sure. Okay, yeah. I mean, the, the newer ones should all do it like this and the older ones. Like, I have some that, that do it like this and some that don't. So for those of you that have this window that I'm showing, all you're going to do is type in an X down there, so D, D, X, and then you're going to type in your function inverse cosine of X to the third times the log of X squared. And then you're going to type in your 0.45 again, and it'll tell you the value. Um, for those of you where it just says in deriv, inside that parenthesis of in deriv, you're going to type the function. So you'll type inverse cosine x cubed log x squared. Um, and in fact, it won't do it like this. So inside your parenthesis, you're going to type in your function. So I'll, I'll type it in. Um, I, even though I don't have the end to rib there. It's inverse cosine of your x to the third log of x squared. And then you're going to type a comma. Then you're going to type an x. Then you're going to type another comma. Then you're going to type a point four five that you want close your parentheses and hit enter. And for those of you that just have the in deriv come up, that should give you the same derivative value. Does that work? Yes. Perfect. So unless you want to go to the library and check out a different TI-84 plus that might show this other notation, you'll have to type it that way. Um, it will still do everything you need it to do. It's just a little bit more of a pain for the notation wise. Any questions? Everybody good with that? All right. Let's see. So we just did this one. I'm not going to bother to write down because we found it. Let's quickly do, we have till 1250, right? Is that right? That's right. Okay, so let's do one more of these real quick uh, and make sure we know how to use this graphing calculator. And I'm going to try sometime in the next couple of days, maybe over this weekend, I'm going to try and record a short video of like all the stuff you should know how to do with your calculator already and post that up so you can take a look at that um, on YouTube and just make sure you know how to do all the things that I want you to know how to do. Um, so we've got a particle moving along the x-axis, so it's moving in a straight line either to the right or to the left. Um, 
and its position is x of t cosine root t. And we want to know the velocity of the particle the first time the particle is at the origin. And we're going to do all the work with our calculator. We're going to write a couple things down. So if the position is x of t equals cosine root t and we're interested in velocity, what is that going to be? Velocity is going to be x prime, right? Derivative of or derivative of position. You guys would agree yep. with that? Okay, good. We're not going to find the derivative of it because we're going to have our calculator do the work for us. But when do we want to know the velocity? We want to know the velocity the first time the particle is at the origin. Well, when the particle is at the origin, what is its position? One. No. If we're at the origin, that should be a you know, number line. Right, it should be a zero. So we want x of t to equal zero. So we want to know, first off, when does the cosine of root t equal zero? All right. Now, we could solve that equation algebraically, but we don't need to because we are given a graphing calculator. I'm telling you we're using a graphing calculator for this problem. So. How will we figure out when the cosine of root t equals zero? Well, we'll go in and we'll graph the cosine of the square root of, we won't use t because the variables in our graphing calculator are x. We'll do cosine of root x and we'll graph it. Now, let me put my window back uh, to what it should normally look like. So here is our graph. We want to know the first time the particle has a position of zero. Well, it looks like that the particle has a position of zero right around t equals two-ish. Would you guys agree? Or x equals two? That's when the position, the y value is equal to zero. So let's zoom in around that. I'm going to zoom in around x equals two. It doesn't have to be perfect, but around there. And we'll then calculate what this exact x-intercept is. And so we'll do that by hitting second trace, which is the calculate window, and we'll choose zero. We're looking for when it equals zero, so we'll choose zero. It will pop up with this window that says left bound. Make sure that your cursor is to the left of the x-intercept. Hit enter. We'll say right bound, and then scroll over until you are to the right of your x-intercept. Hit enter again. It will say guess. It's going to take a guess between those two x values you chose as to what the intercept is. When it says guess, hit enter again. And it will tell you that that x intercept is about 2.4674011. Everybody good with that? Have you all done that before? Two point four six seven four zero. Have you guys done that before or no? No. No. Okay. We're gonna have to spend some. We're gonna have to spend some time learning about our calculators this year, aren't we? I think we are. Okay. Um, I'll make sure to get a video up of that then this weekend with everything you should know how to do on your calculator, and then I'll give you guys just like a non-graded practice sheet of finding certain things on your calculator. Sound good? Just to practice? Yeah. All right, we'll do that. It may be a few days. It may not be until like the end of the week when I get that up. Um, but I'll, I'll get it up eventually. So. Wait, what button, what button did you press on, on, to, on those two points on the other side of the x-axis? So when I, so I went in, I went to second and trace. And I picked zero. And then, so then the first thing I did was I made sure I was to the left of my x intercept. Doesn't matter where, anywhere to the left is good. So I'm definitely to the left of it here. Then you just hit enter. And it says right bound. And then you'll scroll over until you're to the right of it. Doesn't matter where, just so long as you're to the right of it. And then you hit enter again. It says guess. Then you just hit enter again. Okay, thank you. Yep, is that good? Yeah. 
All right, so now we were trying to figure out what is the derivative of the position at this t value. We want to know what's the velocity of the particle at this time when it's first at the origin. Well, if this is our um, velocity function, x prime, all we need to do is evaluate it at this t value. And our graphing calculator should do that for us. All we have to do is, since we're already in the graph, we already have the graph drawn, say second, calculate, choose option six, and we'll type in 2.467411 and evaluate the derivative, and we get negative 0.31831. Everybody see that? <laughs> so it's three one eight three one, I think. Yeah. And on the AP test. Two important things here. One is your final solution, um, unless they specify otherwise, can be rounded to three decimals or more. So 31831 would be fine, but negative 0.318 would also be fine. If you said negative 0.32, this is not okay. Don't round to less than three decimals unless um, they specify that you should. And the other thing is, notice how I did not round this value at all, right? I plugged it in. Do not round any values that you get as you go through the problem. Only round your final solution if you want to. But we'll talk a lot more about that as we do more calculator stuff as the year goes on. Everybody good there or no?